Well, your exams are graded. They weren't awful. Some did better than others. Um, so um, actually, I think the average was pretty decent, and I don't think anybody like cosmically tanked it. So um, hopefully you'll get your exams back from Elliot as soon as you see him next, maybe in lab. Um, I was kind of hoping you might have showed up now. But um, anyway, they are graded. The grades are on Blackboard. Uh, if you want to chase him down and get your exam, uh, be my guest. Um, but you know, basically my feeling is that I think the average was in the 70s maybe. Um, see if I can pull up that information. But... Um, you know, I would say if you hit the average or better, you're probably okay. Uh, if you're below the average, you know, you're going to want to do some catch-up pretty quickly. Uh, we, you know, you definitely, this is all stuff you need to be kind of up to speed on. Okay, blackboard's not coming up. Okay. Um, actually, here it is. Grades, full grade center. So, yeah, I think the average is in the 70s. Yeah, so I would say if you get, did like in the like in the like up in the eighties or above, you're probably fine. If you're in the seventies or below, you definitely want to uh, start thinking about playing catch up. Yeah, definitely. Nobody tanked it. That's pretty unusual for one of my tests. Okay. Um, so last week we did um, we did first order systems. So kind of let me let me give you the like basically where we're headed. Um, we did first order systems. And um, so keep in mind, with any kind of system, you can put in any input you want. You can put in a square wave, you can put in a sine wave, you can put in a, like a speech signal, whatever signal you want. So far, the only signal that we've put in has been a, um, a step input. Okay, so we basically, we solved first order systems for step inputs. Today and Wednesday, we're going to work on second order systems. And again, we're going to look at them in terms of step response, which is fine. Like a step response is fine. You know, it's totally worth studying. However, where this class really gets interesting is what happens when instead of putting in a step input, you try start putting in other inputs. Like we're going to want to put in cosines, okay, and then very vary the frequency of the cosines. We might want to put in some low frequency cosines, some high frequency cosines, and you're already doing this a little bit in lab. In class, we'll kind of work on the, um, on kind of the background of that, that makes all that work. Um, so basically what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about what's a generic second order system, how to calculate its step response, what the flavors are, and then once we get that done, we'll know what's a first, what's a second, and then we'll be able to, to go to the next chapter uh, we'll actually start putting um, sinusoidal signals into those uh, systems and see what happens, because that's where it really gets interesting. So basically, right now we're finishing Chapter 7. Uh, hopefully by the end of the week we'll be working on Chapter 8. Are we good? Maybe we'll finish the material early this semester. We could just like stop in November. Wouldn't that be cool? Yep. You think I'm allowed to do that? Or I'm like obliged to just keep talking till, till, till Christmas? I think if we could get it done early, we'd just call it a day, right? That'd be, I never even thought of that. I'm like, you know, there's not that many chapters left. Okay. Well, we'll see. So, um, so let us build, um, let us build this circuit. So this is an inductor, L, a resistor, R, and a capacitor, C. We've got an input voltage, and we've got an output voltage. And I want to know what's the output voltage as a function of time. So, bleh. I need an equation, right? I always need an equation. 
So I don't know. How do I start? Mesh and node, loop, guess. Shall I just guess? What's that? KVL. OK, so I'm going to start here. That's a 0 volts. OK, then I'm going to jump up here. Now I'm at V in volts. All right, what's the inductor doing for me? What's the equation for an inductor? Right, a generic inductor is V equals L di dt. So good, you learned that somewhere along the lines, along the ways. So, okay, so can we agree there's only one current in this circuit? Can we agree with that? Because the same current that goes to the inductor also goes to the resistor, also goes to the cap. There's only but one current, right? So we'll draw a big current like that, and that will be I. Okay, now, uh, what, is, what is V for that inductor? Well, I know V equals L D I D T, but what, what V really means is, in English, is voltage across inductor. So is the voltage across the inductor V in, V out? This is V in, but is that the voltage across the inductor? V out? I'm confused. V in minus V out? What if I do this? Does that help? <laughs> okay, what does that do for me? Right, the voltage across the inductor is V in minus Vx. Okay, so the voltage across the inductor is L di dt. Okay, that's good. Now we're not, not, we're, we're not talking nonsense anymore. We're back to reality. Okay, that's good. All right, tell me another equation to write. Let's do an equation for the, uh, for the resistor. Vx minus V out over R, over R. equals what? I. Okay, you want to write it like that? Over R equals I? Sure. That's good. That's an equation. That's not lying. All right, what about the cap? CDVDT? I? I wait, what, what's, what's CDVDT? We know I equals CDVDT. Fine, everybody knows that, but what I, what V? Right, the voltage across the capacitor is V out minus this voltage, which is zero. So we can just say V out. So I equals C dV out dt. Hubba hubba. OK. What am I going to do now? Solve for I. Solve for I. Remember, I want to get V out. Right, that's my goal, is to get an equation for V out. So I got two variables I need to purge out of this system. I got to get rid of Vx, and I actually want to get rid of I as well. So, yeah, getting rid of Vx is pretty easy, actually. I mean, I could basically, if I wanted to, I could solve both those equations for Vx and set them equal to each other, couldn't I? OK. Um, another way, like an easy way to do it is, um, you know, I could just, so I could do that. I could basically. Solve for Vx and then set, set them equal. And that would get rid of Vx. Let me just show you like my, my like quick eyeball way of doing it. And that would be this. So this is going to accomplish exactly the same thing. Um, supposing we start at Vn. OK? Now I'm going to account for two voltage drops. If I start at Vn, I'm going to have a voltage drop across the inductor, right? What's my voltage drop across the inductor? 
the voltage, the drop across the inductor is L dI dt. So if I start with V in, I subtract off the voltage drop across the inductor, and then I subtract off the voltage drop across the resistor. What's that? That's just the voltage drop across the, across the resistor. So I start at V in. I have a voltage drop across the inductor, which is LDIDT. V equals LDIDT. So subtract off the drop across the inductor. Subtract off the drop across the resistor. And where does that leave me? V out. Which is exactly the same thing. I mean, that's not magic. That's exactly what you would get if you took each of those equations, if you solve this one for Vx, solve this one for Vx, and set them equal to each other, you would get that. Okay, I just like doing it this way. It like, makes a little bit more intuitive sense to me. You start here, you get an LDIDT drop across the inductor, and a V equals IR drop across the resistor. So if you take V in, subtract off the two drops, you're left with V out. Okay, so that's better now. So I got rid of Vx, but now I still want to get rid of I. So watch what I'm going to do. So I'm going to work with this equation, and everywhere where I see I, I'm going to substitute. So I've got V in, that's cool, minus L. Now, uh-oh, now I've got the IDT, but I don't want I. So can I use this equation to substitute in for I? Well, I don't need I, though. I need di dt. Yeah, so if this is I, can I? I got you. You got it? Yeah. OK. So if you've got I, what is di dt? d squared, right? Right. If I equals C dV out dt, if we take the derivative of both sides, we find out that di dt equals, C is just a constant, that doesn't affect the derivative, so then it's d, I can never keep this straight, what is it, d squared V out over dt squared? I don't know why the mathematicians have to find all this ugly terminology for things. I like the V out double prime, that's a little cleaner. Okay, but can we agree that this is an appropriate substitution for di dt? Totally, right? That's di dt. So look, L, now I need to put in di dt. I'm just going to use this expression. This expression is nice because I don't have i in it. I don't want i. Right? I, just want, I just want everything in terms of v because that's just what I decided I wanted. So it's going to be c d squared v out dt squared. OK. That's not bad. It's ugly, but it's not bad. OK, minus. Now we've got to do the IR. So what am I going to do with my I? C D V D T. So it's going to be R C D V out D T. And that's going to equal V out. Blah. not pretty. Could be worse. Could be a lot worse. Okay. Can I clean it up a little bit? Yeah. Totally. Here's what I'm going to do. Um, there, this is kind of arbitrary. I'm just going to rewrite it like this. I'm going to rewrite it as, um, okay, I'm going to get tired of doing those. Can I just say V out double prime? Can I do that instead of the Okay, V out double prime uh, plus uh, R over L V out single prime plus 1 over LC V out equals V in over LC. Is that right? 
That's a legitimate question. I totally could have screwed this up. So you, you, you're dividing this town by uh, L? I'm divide, right. I divided everything through by LC. So the dv out square term, the second derivative now has a coefficient of 1. This term I divide by LC. That gives me the C's cancel, leaves me with, leaves me with R over L. That term is 1 over LC, and that term is 1 over LC. I actually think, I think we're pretty good. No, I disagree. Because look, if you brought this term over and this term over, they'd both become positive, and then everything would be positive. Pretty sure about that. What do you think? I'm sorry? Wouldn't V out be over LC? Yeah, V out times 1 over LC. No, because I divided through by LC. That's the second derivative of V out. So we always do this thing when we write these differential equations. It's always nice to have, like, whatever the biggest derivative is, have a coefficient of 1. That's just kind of the standard uh, definition. OK, so we took this big, ugly system. And instead of being left with a first order differ differential equation, now we're stuck with a second order differential equation. And now we have problems. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this system a couple ways. Um, so this is cool. This represents the actual circuit that we have in mind. Um, but what we're going to do is we're basically going to learn to solve. So we're the first order system. We learned to, to like how to solve it once. Okay. We learned that once you know what the time constant tau is, you don't have to resolve the differential equation every time, right? There's just one answer. Yes? That's an equals, I beg your pardon. That's a lousy equals sign. Okay. Um, right? So it's the same thing with the, different, with the second order differential equation. It's ugly, but turns out you only need to solve it once in your life. And then once you solved it, like, you just know what the answer is going to be, right? You just, or if you forget, you look it up in a, in a book, right, for the equation. Right, easy enough. And that's what we're going to do here. So, um, so the game is played like this. Now, instead of resistors and inductors, uh, we could easily make a different circuit that had, um, you know, maybe like two inductors. Or I don't want to get too hung up on the resistors and the inductor and the capacitor. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rewrite this as um, as a generic um, as a kind of a generic second order. differential equation. And I'm going to rewrite it in two forms. So why don't we start with this? Why don't we say y double prime plus a y prime plus uh, b y equals, um, help me out here, b x. Is that basically what we've come up with so far? OK. So all I'm trying to say here by substituting in A and B is that let's not get too hung up on resistors and capacitors. Because I could easily come up with, um, like if you, if, if you were mechanical engineers, okay, they would teach you the exact same math. Because you could have um, like a mass hanging on a spring, and there's friction, and I don't know what other the components are. But basically, it's the exact same math that describes it. Okay? So what I'm trying to say is let's not get too hung up on the on the actual components that led to the second order differential equation. Let's just kind of think of it generically and, and solve it. All right. So, um, so as always, we need two, two solutions, right? There's the, um, anybody remember what the, so how this works? Homogeneous and the particular. So let's start with the, um, let's start with the particular solution. And again, the particular solution depends on the particular input. And for today, our particular input is always going to be a step input for today. Okay? On Friday or on Monday, we're going to kick this thing with a sine wave. Okay? And then it's all going to, it's going to go belly up quickly. Okay? But for today, we're just going to kick it with a, sine, with, a, with a step input and see what happens. So a step input 
basically means that for t greater than 0, what does x of t equal? Here's a step. Here's t equals 0. What's my step for t less than 0? x of t equals 0. What's my step for x of t greater than 0? For t greater than 0? It's a constant. Okay, and let's see, let's make it even easier. Let's just make it 1. Okay, this is exactly the same, the same thing we did in, for uh, the first order system. So for now, let's assume that our input is a constant. You want to say 1 or should we say like A? A, okay, we'll do this with A. Okay, so what do you hypothesize? So remember, it's, it's a guess and check approach. So what do you hypothesize should be the, um, yeah? What's the difference between that first order and second order of Huh? No, these are the steps. Those are just the inputs. Right. Now the difference will be in the outputs, okay. which we haven't gotten to yet for this system. So, okay. So we did guess and check. So what do you guess is a reasonable guess for the output of this system if the input is a constant? A reasonable guess is that your output is also a constant. Okay. So let's guess that your output, your particular output, is also some constant. So if it is true that this guess is correct, then what you should be able to do is substitute back into the differential equation and prove that your guess holds, that it makes sense. So let's try that. Let's see whether or not the particular solution holds. OK, so I need to substitute in here. Um, so let's see. If this is y, I need y prime and y double prime. So if, y, if, the, if I'm guessing that my y is a constant, what's y prime? Right? If, if y is a constant, what's y prime? Zero. And y double prime? Well, that's cool. This equation just got pretty sweet. So let's substitute. 0 plus some constant times 0 plus b times y equals b times my input constant x. So does this equation hold? Is, is it possible that, that my output is a constant, given that my input's a constant? As lo yes. It is true. So basically, that's 0, that's 0. The b's cancel. So it is true as long as k equals a. So that is your particular solution. So your particular solution is that y of p is whatever the same constant is as your input. So here's what I mean by that. So suppose your input is x of t is this step, right? x of t equals 1. So I'm going to drive the second order system. What we've just decided is, is that your output, let's see, I guess we'll draw our output down here. So here's t equals 0 where we turn the input on. I don't know what's going to happen in the short term. But I know after some long period of time, my output, y of t, is going to equal 1, the same as my input. That's what we just decided. Okay? In this problem, we said if x of t is 1, what's y of t? Well, y of t is also going to equal 1. That's the particular solution. Okay? This part here is the particular. Right? The input's a constant. We've just determined that the output's a constant. So if you remember the first order system, 
Okay, we did the exact same thing in the first order system. In the first order system, we basically figured out that the steady state response was a constant, and then the only thing we had to figure out was how we got, like what happened in, in, the, in the middle part, right? And for a first order system, we figured out that it was this, this exponential business, right? Remember that? That was the 1 minus e to the minus t over tau. Remember that? It was only two days ago. I promise we did it right here in this room. Okay. Um, so now, now we're talking about a second order system, though. So how we get from here to here, I don't know. We've got we to gotta look at the differential equation again. We can't assume it's the same as before. So whatever happens in this zone, that will be the homogeneous solution. So let's solve for the homogeneous solution. And again, it's not terribly pleasant to do this, but you do it once. Now once you've done it once, you leave it be. Okay, you don't keep solving it over and over again. So we'll do this slightly unpleasant math one time, and then we'll, you know, we'll call it a day. So how do, we, how do we get the homogeneous solution? What's like the, trick, the big trick for that? How do we do it on, uh, for the first order system? Right. To get the homogeneous solution, you always set your input equal to zero, which makes sense, right? Your particular solution is the response to the driving signal. That's what we already did. The homogeneous solution is sort of the inherent circuit response to being activated, right, to being perturbed. And that doesn't have anything to do with the input. So you set the input equal to zero. Okay, so hmm. What do you think I should do? Once again, not really a rhetorical question. Like, what do I do? Before, when it was a first order system, it was pretty easy, right? We just separated it and integrated it. But now I can't really do separation and integration. Yes, but why? Because it's got a it does sort of look quadratic y, doesn't it? Here's what I'm going to do. We are going to do the quadratic equation. But let me motivate a little bit about where that quadratic comes from. We need, so we've set, we're setting x to 0. Okay, so that's 0. So I need a function. I want you to think about what function y could solve this. I need a function y where I'm going to take y its first derivative and its second derivative, and add those pieces together and get zero. So do you, think, do you know of a function where like, the function itself doesn't change dramatically when you take its first and second derivative? E. e. Right? Remember the exponential function? When you take its derivative, it doesn't change a whole lot. So I'm going to guess. I want to verify. I wanna, this is a guess. I want to hypothesize that um, a solution is uh, k e to the s t. I'm guessing, OK? And what I'm going to do is I'll substitute in and I'll see whether this guess works. The reason I'm guessing this is because I know I need something that when I take its first and second derivatives, it doesn't change that much, because I'm going to add those pieces together and get 0. And I know with the exponential, that's exactly, that's exactly what happens. All right? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to take this y. I think this y might be the right answer. I'm going to sub it into here and see what happens. I'm also going to do one other little trick before I do that substitution. And um, this, is, this is a little professor's sleight of hand. Don't lose too much sleep over this. I'm going to rewrite this ever so slightly. I'm going to leave everything the same, but instead of a and b, I'm just going to use different coefficients. You with me? All right, watch this. So instead of this, we're going to write y double prime plus, let me make sure I get this right, or otherwise we'll be nowhere quickly, plus 2 zeta omega naught y prime plus 
omega naught squared y equals zero. Huh? Now, don't panic. Look, a is a constant, is it not? Just some number. That's just some other number, right? It's just also a constant. It's just I'm breaking it into little pieces. So this is basically your a, and this is basically your b. But it's still a constant times the first derivative of a constant times y. Eh, nothing fancy. I promise you. The good news is we're not going to do third order. You know why? Or fourth. Because for two reasons. One is... Almost everything can be approximated by a first or a second order system, right? Even if you have a system that's more sophisticated than a uh, second order system, you can usually lop off some higher order terms that don't matter that much and just be left with a second order system and model it. The other thing that happens a lot is that you can take, let's say if you have a third order system, you can often model it as a first order system plus a second order system kind of mushed together and you get basically the same answer. So uh, this is as ugly as it gets. And it ain't that bad, right? We go through the math just to kind of have that experience that it ain't that bad. Okay, so let's verify that this is in fact a solution to our differential equation. So in order to substitute in, I need the first and the second derivatives, right? So I'm guessing that y equals ke to the st. So if that's true, what will my first derivative be? Ske to the st. Yep, and my second derivative? S squared K E to the ST. Awesome. I think it's like uh, when we study differential equation, I think it's that yeah. after you go S and like S and S. Yeah, this is exactly it. I mean, you should have, this should all be stuff you've seen in differential equations. Absolutely. No, no, I mean, it's. That's why you learn in differential equations. This should be a review in theory. OK, so let's substitute in. S squared k e to the st plus 2 zeta omega naught times y prime, which is s k e to the st plus omega naught squared, where am I? k e to the st equals zero. Oh, you're saying it's ugly. Bah. But I'm saying it ain't that bad. Because look what I can do. What can I substitute out of every term? K e to the st. So can I not say k e to the st times s squared plus 2 zeta omega naught s plus omega naught squared equals 0. OK, now let's not panic. Look, if I want, so this is a product of two terms, right? It's this term times this term. And I know that their product has to equal 0. So how do I get the product of two things to equal 0? One of them's got to be 0, right? So can I get this first term to be 0? Right, e to the something will never be 0. It can get pretty close to 0, but it can never be 0. So that's if, if this equation is going to hold, if, right? That's the whole question. If this equation is going to hold, it ain't going to be because of that term. So now let's investigate whether or not this term equals 0. Yes? No, if the constant's zero, then, then, then y is just zero, and that's, that's nothing. That's just like, there's a name for that, what it's like, the stupid solution. Um, no, no, this, I don't mean to be dismissive. It's, your comment's not stupid. It's just, it's like, um, they call it like the degenerate case or something. It's just, it's a non, it mathematically solves the equation, but it doesn't tell you anything. Okay, so this equation could still hold as long as, s squared plus 2 zeta omega naught s plus omega naught squared equals 0. 
Okay. So remember, our whole thing was, I'm guessing that Ke to the st can be a solution to this. Okay? And so far, what I'm finding is that, yes, this can be a solution, provided that s satisfies this quadratic equation. Can I solve for s? Do we, do we have that technology? That's just quadratic equation, right? So let's give it a shot. So s equals, all right, so it's minus b. You guys remember this equation? You're going to learn that in the fourth, fourth grade or whatever, whatever they teach that. Minus b. The board does not erase well. Okay, so it's minus 2 zeta omega naught plus or minus the square root of that term squared minus 4 times 1 times omega naught squared and the whole thing over, over 2a. Bah. It's actually not that bad, because watch, all, all sorts of happiness is going to happen. So, okay, look at this term. This term is really 4 zeta squared omega naught squared minus 4 omega naught squared. Is it not? So can I not factor out a 4 omega naught squared? because it's common to both terms in that radical. So if I bring out a 4 omega naught squared out of the radical, what is that going to leave me with? So I've got minus 2 zeta omega naught plus or minus 2 omega naught radical zeta squared minus 1 all over 2. The two's all cancel. Is this actually the same thing that they get in the book? Holy mackerel. It is the same thing they got in the book. I feel really good about that. Okay. Um, so let me just write this over here. I'm sorry for my awesome board technique where I'm working right to left. Um, so finally, so S has to equal minus zeta omega naught plus or minus omega naught root zeta squared minus 1. The end. You feel good about that, right? Now, so is it possible that my particular solution has this form? Yes, on the condition that I have two S's that meet that criteria. So, I think we should do an example where we actually stick numbers in here and see what happens. So... I have a question. The book got the J some kind of... Uh, oh, the book has a J in there? Yeah. We'll get to the J in a second. That's zeta squared? Right, the book has a J. Let's not fret too much about the J for a second. Yeah, 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 we'll get to that. We'll get to that, I promise. Okay, so shall we, let's, um, let's go back to our circuit and, and stick in some numbers and see what happens. So let's say, um, I'm just going to redraw the exact same circuit. So there's an inductor, a resistor, a capacitor. Okay, so I don't know. Somebody tell me an inductor value. Two millihenries. I heard two millihenries. Can I get a resistor? Nine mega? Really? We're going to put millions in there? Help a guy out here. Two ohms. Two K. I do two K. Uh, I don't really know how any of this is going to end, so you'll be just as surprised as me. And like, can I get a capacitance? 0 0.5 what? Micro. 
Farads, thank you for knowing what the units of a capacitor are. <laughs> People who will be getting college degrees in two years. Okay. So, uh, according to us, we said that V out double prime, so it was what, what L over R was the second term. What was the next coefficient? Seriously, what was the next? Look in your notes. R over L. R over, thank you. R over L, first derivative, plus 1 over RC, LC, plus 1 over LC, V out equals um, V in over LC. Okay, and we already know that, so we're assuming our input is a step, so we already know that our output is basically exactly like you see over here. We, all, we already know that if you leave this thing, look at this, if you leave this circuit on long enough, what's going to happen to the, uh, so, you, so let's say your input was first zero and then you stepped it up to one volt. So what's going to happen to the capacitor at steady state? If you leave the circuit on long enough. Right, the cap's going to charge and become an open circuit. When it becomes an open circuit, what's, what's the current going to the circuit? Zero. So if there's no current at steady state, if there's no current flowing through the circuit, uh, the voltage drop across this is L di dt. If I is zero, then di dt is zero. And there's no voltage drop across here. This is IR. If I is zero, the IR drop is also zero. So that means from here to here, there's no drop. So if this is one volt, that's one volt. Hey, that's what we got from solving the differential equation, right? So look, you turn on the power. If you wait long enough, that cap's going to charge up to one volt. So we already knew that, right? I'm just saying that like the common sense matches the, the nonsense that we got from the differential equation. The question now is, what happens in the middle? Um, let me just see if this is going to give us something meaningful here. A equals R over L. Uh, B equals 1 over LC, where R equals 2,000, L equals 2 millihenries, and C equals half a microfarad. So this is nice for me to do just because I can, I'm going to have like two seconds advance over you knowing whether or not this is going to work. Sweet. Okay. So, um, so what's my value of A? A, A is R over L, right? So let's see. R over L. R is 2,000. L is 2 milli. So the 2's cancel. So I've got 10 to the 3 over 10 to the minus 3. Six. Somebody said six. That's good. I'll, I'll pretend that was the right answer. Good. Okay. Six. Good. Ten to the six. A million. Good. All right. Uh, now B is one over LC. Let's see what you've done for me here. So L is two. So I'm doing this times this. So the two and a half cancel. So minus three minus six is minus nine. And it's one over that. That's ten to the nine. Wow. <coughs> Okay. So far, so good. So what is, um, so let's see, what is, so we also know that A happens to equal 2 zeta omega naught, and B also happens to equal omega naught squared. So tell me, friends, uh, can I calculate zeta and omega naught? Yes, you can. Which one's easiest to start with, zeta or omega naught? Omega naught, right? Just look at this equation. So if omega naught squared is 10 to the ninth, omega naught, oops, what's that? I don't know, it's the square root of 10 to the ninth. Square root of 1e9, ah, 3.16 times 10 to the 4.
We'll write that down. That sounds important. Is that snoring? I don't know, there's a noise. It sounds like someone's snoring. Okay. Um, okay, and so now can I solve for zeta? Sure, because I know 2 and I know omega naught. I know 10 to the 6. So I can solve this equation for zeta. So zeta is going to equal... No, 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 let me do it. It's totally cool. I've got a computer right here. You guys are tired from sitting there. Um, so 10 to the 6 divided by 2 times omega naught. Holy cow. Can somebody validate my answer? I'm pretty sure I didn't get the right answer. Actually, no, maybe I did. I got 15.8? Yeah? Okay. So, omega naught is called the natural frequency of this system. Zeta is called the damping ratio. Now, you might be asking yourselves, can't we just saw, couldn't we have just gotten S without even going through this nonsense of omega and zeta? Like, we could have just gotten that same answer with, we could, we could still solve our quadratic equation just by using A and B, and the answer is, yeah, totally you could have. But it turns out it's going to be really helpful to know zeta and omega naught, and that will become a little bit more evident as we move forward. So, let's put all this together. What's the solutions to my, uh, what are my values of S that make my solution work? So S1 and S2. So what I really need is, OK, I've already done it. But basically what I've done is I've, um, I've solved basically the, it's, it's S squared plus R over LS plus 1 over LC. I've solved that for S. Um, and I did the intermediate step of solving for zeta and omega naught. I could take those values and substitute right in here, and that would give me my answer. Okay, so if you do minus zeta times omega naught plus the square root, you know, omega naught times square root zeta squared minus 1, you'll get the first answer. And then substitute that plus for minus, you get the second answer. So I'm getting minus 9.99 times 10 to the fifth. And 0.01 times 10 to the, is it positive fifth or minus fifth? Positive fifth. And minus 0.01 times 10 to the fifth. Those are my two values of S. Yes? We solved this. This is, the, this, is the solu this is the hand calculation for S. We got that by solving the quadratic equation. There's two S's, plus and minus. So what this is telling me is the solution to my differential equation is the constant 1, that's our particular solution, plus some constant, e to the s1t, plus some other constant, e to the s2t, where s1 and s2 are as advertised. How, how do you get the, uh, oh, it's Seriously, ask questions. I, 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 you, it's good that you ask questions. There's a lot going on here. Where do the k's come from? The k's were always part of my solution, right? I guessed. Didn't I start by guessing that my particular solution was K e to the s, or my homogeneous solution was K e to the st. Well, there you go. There's your K. How am I going to get values for K? Initial values. Yes. Uh, 
Uh, turns out that for the system response, like for the homogeneous response, you can guess that every time. And that's the only one. It just works. Yes? S values are always going to be negative. That's a great question. Are the S values always going to be negative? No. Um, they might be complex sometimes. What's the negative value indicate? What does the negative value indicate? So let, let me, okay, I've got like one minute, and then we'll, we'll, we'll finish this up like this. So real numbers, imaginary numbers. So right now, we've just done this solution, and we figured out one of our S values is over here at minus 9.99 times 10 to the 5, and the other S value is here, minus 0.01 times 10 to the 5. So they're both negative. Negative indicates that if this is e to the negative sum number, that means if you wait long enough, what happens to it? It decays away, which makes sense, right? You want the particular solution, sorry, the homogeneous solution to decay away, and then you'll just be left with the particular solution. So your number always has to be, the real, val the real part always has to be negative, because otherwise it won't decay away. Um, if you ever wind up in a situation where you've got positive, then your, your system, instead of the, the homogeneous solution disappearing, it'll actually go to infinity. It's an unstable system. When you get to control theory, you'll talk about that. Um, so the one alteration, though, is instead of having, if you look at our differential equation, what if zeta was less than 1? Right now we've got zeta was 15. What if zeta came out to be less than 1, between 0 and 1? What would happen to my values of s? They'd be complex. They'd still have negative real parts, but they'd be complex. That's OK. You can have that. That's what we're going to talk about on Wednesday. But the real part always has to be negative. Otherwise, it's, a sta it's, otherwise it's not a stable system. That's kind of a cool question. OK, so come back on Wednesday. We'll, we'll actually plot the solution to this. OK, and then we'll try again where our system has complex roots instead of, um, instead of real ones.